I'm with my friends here today. Thank you very much for joining us. This is going to be a little different. Unlike our previous panels, I want to introduce a few people who have been on panels prior, but also for those that have not had the chance, I'm with Adadoin and Dorian. I want to make sure that we get to know a little bit about what they're working on, some of the challenges in their respective countries. So I want to start there. This is open forum. It's about questions, interactions. I hope people can ask us through the chat. We're going to ask each other questions. But before we do that, I want to first introduce Dorian, who's joining us from Sierra Leone. I know we ain't, we've been speaking to Good each evening. other. Hey, how are you doing? Glad that you were able to connect because we may drop. She may drop out any moment. You know, I know you've had a challenging time connecting. So it's, it's no, you, but, yeah. but we've been talking back and forth over the last couple of months and having short 15, 20 second conversations over WhatsApp. And then it would drop off and then we would speak and we would talk to each other through voice messages. So now I'm glad that we get to do this in the live. And so he'll be joining us. Of course, he's right here in front of you all. And of course, Adadoin, welcome. Sort of welcome back because you were on a previous panel, but then things didn't work out. And now you're here live. So I, great to be here. Yeah, I want to first start off with you and get to know a little bit about what you're working on. I know you run and started a company called Digital Jewels right out of right. Nigeria. Tell us a little bit about your background, your experience and what you're working on. Right. Thanks, Jonathan. So it's great to be here. We're supposed to be in a panel two nights ago, but the technology just didn't work out. And so my name is Eddie. What you're working on. Right. Thanks, Jonathan. So it's great to be here. We're supposed to be in a panel two nights ago, but the technology just didn't work out. I can hear myself. My name is Eddie. What you're working on. Yeah. We want to make sure. Right. Does anybody have the live session playing on two screens? Yeah, I'm checking to see where it's coming from. Right. Yeah. We want to make sure. Right. Does anybody have the live session playing on two? I think that hopefully that works out. Try that. Okay. So. My name is Adejo Yadunfa, I'm the founder CEO of Digital Jewels. We are an IT governance risk and compliance consulting and capacity building firm. We have a presence, we have a footprint in about nine African countries, that would include Nigeria, where we were headquartered in Lagos. We have an office in Lagos and Abuja, in Nigeria, and in Accra, and in Nairobi, and in Kigali. We've also had the opportunity to do business in Sierra Leone, and in, in um, the DRC and in Zambia, and also in the Gambia, uh, amongst other African countries. We essentially help organizations strengthen their processes and equip their people with the skills that they require and to make technology work more optimally in their organizations. Our areas of focus are around essentially what we call the information value chain. We see information as an asset to any corporate organization. And while that might seem obvious, maybe not so in Africa, there is a tendency to, to, to place uh, a lot of value on things that are more tangible than information. And so we talk about helping organizations secure and assure and enable and empower and manage their information assets. And the way we do this is um, principally through information and cybersecurity processes, um, systems, people, um, IT governance, risk management, compliance, and, and, this, and stuff like that. Our primary vehicle for strengthening processes for organizations and equipping people is global best practice standards. We found them to be an effective vehicle for getting people to speak the same language and understand at the baseline of you know, what the rudiments that they need to meet in order to be able to use technology efficiently and securely. And so we ourselves as a firm are certified to the ISO 27001 standard, the information security standard. We're also certified to the quality management standard, 9001. And we're a qualified security assessor for the payment card industry data security standard. And with this, we have supported probably up to 100 organizations over the last 12 plus years to get certified to certain standards. And we've just found this as a, as a very effective vehicle to help people understand the controls they need to put in place, the processes they need to put in place, the procedures and the policies they need to put in place, the skill levels they need to get their people to, and um, the way that technology just helps to automate all of this. So mm. I'll stop there. 
Wow. I mean, in terms of my myself, my background, I am um, I have an IT background. I've been an IT information and security project management consultant probably all of my life. Um, studying computer science, going on to do an MBA, mm. going on to get various industry certifications. So I can speak to the business side. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur, so I must be able to speak to the business side. Yes, but I've also made a good effort to keep myself technically up to date to ensure that I can still function as a subject matter expert in certain fields of emphasis for the firm. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And I want to emphasize, we want to hear about the person's journey. I like to call it the hero's journey, you know, getting where we are today and how people got there. Mm -hmm. you know, people have a lot of different trajectories from IT, not from IT, from business, from lawyers, from all kinds of industries, diverse places that we start. And here we are today together on this conversation. Mm -hmm. so, so I definitely do appreciate you telling me a little bit about your background. So thank you. We'll return to some of the conversation that you just brought up. Let's turn to Dorian before we lose him because we never know what may happen. So, <laughs> Dorian, welcome. Let's talk let's yeah. about your story, yeah, that hero's journey where you are today. Yeah, um, <laughs> for me, like the time when we were starting out in the secondary school system where you start going into real science and whatnot, we, it was just after the war in the Civil War in Sierra Leone, so there were not a lot of computers lying around. So I came into the ICT world kind of late, to be honest with you. I've always been interested in electronics and geeky things and all of those types of things, but I never had the chance to like really blossom out and do what I wanted to do. So I remember I was in Form 4, um, one class before you take the O-levels, and the school I attended was the first time I did computer studies. And in one year, I passed it without any prerequisite knowledge or everything. So that really put me on the track towards my IT career. And in fact, I started in arts. I was an art student till A-levels, but I always had good results in computing and in biology and all of the sciences. So maybe that was a sign. Mm -hmm. So after I finished my A-levels, I skipped college. I didn't go to university because in art stream, in those days, when you finished arts, you were like, oh, you have to go to law. That's the only thing and not my, in those days, that was not my piece of cake. So I went to a prometric center. That's where I did my A plus, N plus, and CCNA all by the age of 19. And then when I started like working and earning my, my own money, then I started like putting it into my education, paying for myself, paying for myself through university, paying for myself through all of these um, external courses and all of these things. So. I got my S plus in 2016 before cybersecurity became a big thing in Sierra Leone. And when I got the S plus, there was nothing. There was nothing for me to do, to be honest with you. No one was talking about information security in Sierra Leone at that time on in a meaningful way. So it took a lot of time and years, but now I think we're on the right track. And to harken back to the point, um, Adi Doin made about Africans putting a lot of um, um, a lot of um, focus on tangible assets. That is very true. Um, you really have to show people that your information can be used against you as a weapon or as a coercion mechanism, all of these things. So it needs to be protected. People did not think that far down the line. I think it only started, people started taking it seriously when cameras started appearing, like hidden cameras started appearing inside offices, catching people doing things they shouldn't do, and then they got blackmailed because of it. So <laughs> that's when people started taking it seriously. So in this stage right now in Sierra Leone, I think we have come very far. Okay, I had myself I can hear myself for a reason. Oh, you'll hear an echo, but you're okay. We can hear you fine. Okay, okay. Um, uh, right now, I think there has been such a huge push, especially in the go on, on the government side mm -hmm. and on the private sector side, in order to, in order to, um, how would I put it, to have everyone working in a straight line towards getting our information security up to date and all of that. But there are still a lot of holes, especially when it comes to cybersecurity awareness. 
that's where I come in later on because I'm not going to preach to the choir and tell someone who has a CCNA or something about cyber security, to be honest with you, because they should already be able to make that jump to the next level. I'm going to tell the layman who doesn't know that this, like the phone, <laughs> this is one of the most dangerous things people have in their hands and they don't know about. <laughs> they don't know how to see information. It's, it's, it's crazy. I remember the, the first time I did my first, um, it was like five years ago, someone connected their phone to my laptop. And then I'm like, oh, I can actually get into your phone and show you the camera. And they're like, oh, that's a lie, that's a lie. At that time, I was just starting out with Metasploit and all of that. So when I did it, they were like, Damn. And I'm like, yeah, and it can happen over the internet. So I think if you show people the, 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 the downsides and the consequences of not securing your personal devices or your laptops or whatever, properly, they mm -hmm. can actually come on board. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I, one of the reasons why we do this, and I would say the primary themes of our conversation in the last four days is about how to make this compelling for everyday people. We may be speaking to choir when we're talking to each other. It's not going to require too yeah. much for me to tell Adadon or Steve or to confidence that we need security yeah. awareness, but to tell it to everyday yeah. people, everyday people that mm -hmm. are going to the internet for the first time. And there's, I think I read something earlier, we have some 500, 600,000 people interacting with digital communications for the internet for the first time every day. How are we getting education to people who need it the most? And how is that impacting educational awareness outside of just corporations and employees and organizations? It's everyday users all around the world dispersed in communities all around. And so, sorry. So thank you for that. I see Steve up there patiently waiting having a glass of some Chardonnay, right? Is that, that's not, I don't think it's Chardonnay. I'm, I'm so sorry. I was trying to keep that off. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's water. <laughs> yes, red water. <laughs> yes, indeed. I know, Steve, you were in a conversation earlier today, and I know there was a lot of ideas and thoughts that you wanted to share to follow up on some of these conversations we're having. Well, I, 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 li I like the theme of how we got where we mm -hmm. are. Um, I can pretty much guarantee that you shouldn't ever follow my example if you're looking at career planning, because I know where I am today. Uh, most of my career, I could not have told you where I was going. Mm -hmm. I started out as an electronic systems engineer, uh, designing microcircuits and integrated circuits and measurement systems. What I was taught then was systems theory, to think of everything as a system. That was probably the most horrible subject in my degree. I hated it. Yet it is perhaps the only thing I learned at university that I use every day today. Mm. And Adedoin, you, you made a beautiful point where you talked about information is what it's about. The information boundary is the foundation of everything we're doing. It's not the technology. It's not the people. It is the asset value that we are protecting on behalf of everybody. When you take that perspective, understanding the system within which that information exists, mm -hmm. the IT, the network, the storage, the people who access it, the people who own it, the people who use it, it starts to put a perception on what needs to be protected. And that brings me back to my favorite topic. I'm a technologist. But when information security comes down to IT security technology, we've lost the plot. We need the technology, but it's not about the technology. It's about what we do with that technology. And what we do with that technology should be proportionate to the risk that we see to that information. That's a very different perspective than many people have that conversation. If you become a technical whiz, you can become seduced by your mastery of that technology. And there is definitely a place for people like that. We need the technical geniuses to get us through the future. But at some level, we need to make sure that that genius is focused where it can protect the most. 
And that's a dialogue that I think doesn't happen very often. It's something I'm quite passionate about, which is fixing problems so they stay fixed. <laughs> which is why I'm loving all these conversations that I'm basically chipping in on the edge of. Because what I'm hearing, there are some people going here, some people more advanced than I am, and a lot of people trying to catch up. And in terms of awareness, I see our role is spreading that awareness into the cybersecurity professionals. I think we we're talking about it just off stage before we came on. We need to grow chief security officers who understand the value of the information, not because they're the most complicable competent cyber whiz in the company, but because they are adding the most value to the business through their wisdom, experience, and their technique. So that's the way I see cybersecurity as protecting the value of the information asset mm -hmm. on behalf of businesses and on behalf of the subjects of that information. It's another topic of conversation. I'm very concerned that we are digitizing citizenship and we are not enabling the citizens to play an equal role. But I think that's a topic of conversation yeah. from the top. <laughs> want to make sure we get a chance to talk to Confidence. I know you were in that previous panel, but learn a little bit about that journey, your journey. Uh, somebody mentioned here on the chat box that you guys to pay attention to because there's some commentary, sometimes in the form of questions, saying their trajectory into cybersecurity is like a pinball machine. And so it's very hard to chart that, saying that you're going to be here, but then ending up somewhere different. So I'm curious what your trajectory has been, confidence. OK, so for me, um, I've always been in, uh, I had a first time in um, IT and business. I had um, a master's degree in the management of that. So I've, I've, I've always, all my life, wanted to be in the board. I got exposed to cybersecurity while doing my business, um, um, and it was in the form mm -hmm. of cryptography. So um, mm -hmm. I did it just because I, I wanted to feel cool that I was smart, you know. Like my MS, because it was literally I had um, the technical courses coming back in, and in a more advanced level, I had business courses coming back in. It's like I had done strategy management already. I had done, so it was it was feeling like I was just coming in to have a degree, and I didn't want that. I wanted to have some really strong learning and some really good challenges. Generally, if I'm not challenged, I'm bored. So, so um, and I just wanted to pick an elective that was for me tough. And there was this thing around cryptography then uh, being so uh, difficult. I'll go to that one that's really difficult. So I went there just just for the fun of being challenged and seeing some difficult things to. Um, it. And in the process, um, literally really loved it and went on to education, cyber security, and site building from there but before that point um, and and this is what i i think there's always should that one way you just think about to find what takes your, takes your fancy what keeps you at night uh, i said that you don't want to go to sleep um and then when you find that one thing that keeps you that later you just dig right. um and i think that was really my story i i wanted to play a bit i went to cyber school. i was so excited but then um, I found that breaking things was 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 somewhat. I, I spent time learning how to break things. Um, and basically, where uh, my my journey has um, has uh, progressed from to was how to um, plug those. Holes. That's basically been my journey, and then moved on um, to incorporating um, a sense of of teaching people what's possible. I really they are said about uh, um, how things the, the technology they enjoy the, the most these tools can also founded because of that reason I founded um, uh, Nigeria's um, foremost, uh, one of Nigeria's foremost cybersecurity awareness um, not for profits is called Nogo for Maga. So what we do is we we are partnering with organizations. We we have events on our own and just general job awareness about security. Because mm. like you said, like uh, Kolya said, average person on the streets does not understand 
value certain things, does not understand why they should put certain controls in place, does not understand um, until these things happen, until they, they get hacked, get compromised. Recently in Nigeria, you know, I know that Nigeria is known outside of the shows as being the, uh, you know, the originator of attacks. Um, but I must also tell you that we're having quite a lot in inside Nigeria right now, even with experiencing it over social accounts and, and all of that. So it's become more aware that oh, these are people who could have used a lot of money, uh, cyber mm -hmm. attacks. So. Um, I think the need for show and tell too has been a huge thing, and that's why mm. profit by events and tell show how these things can be done, how all scenes can be done, and how that can affect. In that's like what we people and then take action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has to be real, tangible. People have to see it. It's so true, so true. Ado Doin, let's go back to you. You've been studying have a very deep knowledge of the situation and landscape in Nigeria. Tell us a little bit about what are some of the threats that you're seeing and challenges, whether it's on awareness, investments, and communicating with business leaders. How, where, where are things today? Okay, thank you. Interesting question. And I'd like to just take us on a journey, the way that I see the developments that have happened in Nigeria and a few other countries in West Africa. So as, as some of you may know, Nigeria is a very populous country. We've got over 200 million mm -hmm. people, of which about 170 million are on, you know, have mobile phones and about 125 million are on the internet. And that makes us by far the country with the most internet users in Africa. Mm -hmm. If you look also at some of the other matrices of our population, realize that we have a very youthful population. So median age of about 18. Now that's not uncommon in African countries. We generally have a youthful population, but I think our share numbers makes it quite a significant issue. If you match this also with the fact that um, the youth bulge is, is very significant. We have about 46% of our population that are between the ages of 18 and 35 and up to 70% that are under 35. You match that with the fact that a lot of these young people are under or unemployed mm -hmm. um, with skill levels that are you know, nothing to write home about. Now, you also look at the fact that we are not a rich nation, clearly. So you add all these things together, you see a large and growing population, rapidly growing population, largely poor. You see low financial inclusion levels. I think it was about 39% at the last count. Um, and this has improved significantly. I mean, 39% is good from where we're coming from. Rapidly rising internet penetration levels and large and a large number of youths, many on, on underemployed. You then see what could prob probably be a very fertile breeding ground for cyber crime. Mm. Except that I think we took a fairly proactive view a while back. So as far back as 2012, the Central Bank of Nigeria decided that it wanted to get uh, cash out of the economy or reduce the amount of cash in the economy. We've been a very cash heavy um, society. And what was decided was that we had to improve cash management through a payment systems transformation, which would touch on ensuring that we reduce the amount of cash in circulation through the deployment of electronic delivery channels. Um, we improve the IT infrastructure and service level and that we improve back office operations. Now, the vehicle, one of the vehicles they, they chose for this was to institute IT standards and frameworks across the e-payments value chain. And what they did was to come up with a roadmap in 2013, which touched on various areas of IT from information security to service management, to IT governance, you know, project management and so on. And they categorized these areas from point of view of effort and benefit. And information security was categorized as priority one, high, high effort, high, high benefit, and therefore, the central bank that required that all the banks and all the players in the e-payments value chain get certified to PCI DSS at first and ISO 27001 within the first two years of this six year roadmap. This, this essentially made quite a lot of impacts on the ecosystem. By 2019, we found that virtually all the banks were certified to PCI DSS, ISO 27001, um, more than 50% of them to the 
a business continuity standard ISO 22301, quite a few of them to ISO 20,000, the IT service management. Quite a number of them had implemented COVID-5 as an IT governance framework, ITIL, and so on. And because the banking sector, which are very, very heavy adopters um, of technology, had driven that mandate, we found that a lot of their key suppliers also felt mandated um, to, to implement those standards. So a lot of the fintechs put them in place and the public sector also, we, start, we saw that it started to trickle into the public sector. One of the other areas that was emphasized in this transformation program by the central bank was a shared services infrastructure. Because clearly, if we wanted every bank to go and build their own data center, build their own security operation center, and so on, it would have been too expensive. And so therefore, we saw by, by this year, when I was, I was um, reviewing, I realized that we have nine shared data centers in Nigeria, two of which are tier four, and seven of which are tier, tier two, and um, tier three seven of which are tier three and two of which are tier four. And this roadmap that the central bank had um, outlined has been updated periodically. It was updated again last year. Not only is it updated, enforcement is actually checked. So there have been two, two periods when the banks have appointed um, a few consultants, we've been one of them, to go and check the compliance level of the banks so that they can make sure that these things are being enforced. And so, yes, you might ask, I mean, what was the essence? Standards, um, is, is it just standards for the sake of standards? I will speak a little bit to the impact that I think that it has had over the ecosystem over, over the last few years. But last year, the last revision of the standards roadmap also extended it to key services, um, critical services required that those vendors also get get certified to the payment card industry data security standard. Um, some other standards, as well as um, the data center providers also had to get certified to certain standards. The cloud providers had to get certified to standard and so on. Now, to speak specifically to cybersecurity, the central bank didn't stop at the standards roadmap. They also came out with a cybersecurity framework in 2018, which was effective from January 2019. They, they put in place this cybersecurity framework, which required um, that banks and, and payment service providers it achieved a certain baseline in terms of enhancing their cyber resilience and that they adopted a risk-based approach to managing cybersecurity risk. Now, part of this framework had it required that the banks had in place certain rules and responsibilities. And so I see on our panel earlier on today, I saw two of our CISOs from, from Nigeria. And so you will find that today, every bank has a chief information security officer who must have a, who must have a certain number of years of experience, a certain skill level um, that they bring to bear. Mm -hmm. And there, was, there were also quite clearly outlined rules for the board, which again, I think is very important, and the executive management team to play. They also stress the importance of monitoring and mentoring mechanisms through security operating systems. You know, So this framework was really quite robust. It outlined a framework like NIST as a way of implementing some of the recommendations. It touched on cybersecurity governance and oversight, on risk management, on operational resilience, and very importantly on matrices for monitoring and reporting, as well as gathering of cyber threat intelligence mm -hmm. and periodic cyber risk assessments. Now, um, the other part I'd like to touch on in terms of the regulator's role, we have a national IT development agency who has taken up the privacy mandate and has released uh, uh, NDPR, which is the Nigerian Data Protection Regulation, a bit similar to GDPR, um, but has clear specifications about how to ensure the privacy of data in organizations across the nation, and also clear penalties for not putting them in place. So that's sort of the Nigerian experience. I will speak very briefly to the Ghanaian experience because it's similar. So in Ghana, the regulator also took a similar approach. Um, they had tried in 2016 to come out with some recommendations. They called it recommendations at that time to mitigate the occurrence of fraud in the banking sector. And that included the implementation of PCI DSS and ISO 27001. Unfortunately, that didn't seem taken very seriously by the banking sector at that time. And that mandated the Bank of Ghana to come up with 
a directive which it called the Cyber and Information Security Directive in 2018. Now that was a lot more prescriptive and a lot more definitive and it required that all banks get certified to 20, the ISO 27001 standard and the 27032 which are the cyber security guidelines. It also required that they get certified to PCI DSS. It outlined like the Nigerian cyber security uh, framework, a number of roles and responsibilities for CISO, for senior management and for the board. So what would I say have been the benefits of this sort of regulator driven approach? You know, I, I mean, we've had the opportunity to, to interact with many players in the industry. And I would say I've seen two sets of people. The people who just see it as compliance, um, this is what the regulator says, so let's just do it. And those are the people who I don't think have gotten the tremendous benefit that others have. And what I tell them, especially if they're my clients, is, you know, you have to do it, make it count. Because if you actually implement it effectively, this can significantly improve the level of your security, you can improve your security posture, reduce your vulnerability profile, and improve the, the, the standard of IT services that you deliver. So those ones who have taken it as an improvement process, an improvement option, have seen lots and lots of improvement. Overall, I would say that we now have a critical mass of certified organizations permeating the entire value chain, you know, banks, switches, fintechs. We have high numbers of certified specialists in global best practice standards. Mm. We have significant deployment of world-class technology. In the cybersecurity space, you will find that in Nigerian banks and financial institutions, they have very sophisticated threat intelligence and response management systems, sophisticated identity and access management systems, data loss prevention systems, um, security and vulnerability management, unified threat management, enterprise risk and compliance, and so on. We've also seen that there's been a much higher level of awareness generally. I talked about the skill levels, but awareness on the whole. I mean, I, I have been very much involved in awareness at board and executive level. And usually what I do, I don't go to the board meetings with PowerPoint slides. I think everybody's eyes gets glazed over when they see those things these days. I sort of try and take them through a simulation, which I realize really, really hits home to them. And I use a scenario that they can identify with. So I remember on a board, I used an executive kidnap scenario. Everybody was sitting at the edge of their chair because I wasn't just talking about something that was the remote. This was about them, you know, and the, the, the reality that this could happen made them sit up and say, OK, so what does our business continuity arrangements say about this? You know, don't let's just sign off documents that are meaningless. Let's make sure that we can put these things into practice. So we've seen that the awareness levels have grown. We've also seen that um, the shared service model has been fairly successful. It has reduced cost and increased operational efficiency. And without a doubt, the private sector has been more impacted than the public sector, even though the public sector is growing quickly. So in my view, clearly, the threat landscape is growing globally and in Africa is growing rapidly. But I think that this kind of holistic approach, whereby you take the regulators and you take the players and you let them all focus on something that is measurable, because I think that that is the benefit of a standard. You can get certified to it by a third party. You have to meet certain minimum requirements to get it, you know, and then you have to maintain it. It's not something that you get and then you can just go back to business as usual. Mm -hmm. There, you know, there's a cycle that you must maintain. So that holistic approach that emphasizes governance, because this requires senior level engagement, risk management and compliance, and that addresses process people, and technology in one vehicle is, mm -hmm. has been helpful. The regulators definitely have a role to play. I've seen that in our other markets, like in East Africa, where the regulator hasn't been quite so bullish, the, the development has been a lot slower and a lot more sporadic. Um, in terms, I'm not talking about slower in terms of technology deployment. It's one thing to develop technology. And I think that the African economies have seen quite a lot of um, investment in technology, but not necessarily measurable um, uh, measurable benefit. And so it's the governance that you need to put around it. It's the risk management that you need to put around it. It's a focus on the business and what it can do to actually improve your business performance and safeguard you from downside risk that makes the difference at the end of at the end of the day. 
So okay. the cybersecurity market in, in Africa is still at the early stages, no doubt. But I think there's some things that we've gotten right um, in West Africa that probably other African regions can put to play and even other countries outside Africa. Uh, sometimes the regulator approach is seen as a as a big stick approach, but it need not be. It can be a stakeholder centric approach. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one thing that we got right, because in some cases where the central bank realized that the deadlines were too stringent, they relaxed them a bit, but they didn't really Relax the goal, you know. So I think that that has that has helped us, and I just thought I would share that very briefly, very briefly in this um, in this form. No, that's very fascinating. We're going to have to have you back again because there's so much there to tease out. I mean, the, the model of the regulatory approach, the central banks framework, and that model for success seem to work very well. I really want to spend more time looking at that, and I'm sure Steve, you have some ideas on how that works or how has it not worked in where you're most familiar and comfortable with in South Africa. I'm curious. Well, I, I, I did have a response ready to go, but <laughs> you've stolen all my thunder. <laughs> Many of the same principles are being deployed in South Africa. Okay. Um, I, I, I talk about compliance-based security as being a start, not an end point. I think you covered that way more eloquently than I could. If, if all you aim for is compliance, you've probably already yeah. failed, but you still tick the box for having done something. If you take the risk approach, compliance yeah. is the first step of achievement. Mm -hmm. It's the start of the journey. But as I said, you, you, you finished that story from me, so I'm not going to repeat it. We have the same kind of environment. We have high speed connectivity to the rest of the world. Yeah. Uh, we bridge five different international fibers, we've got all the satellite, we've got uh, Microsoft and Amazon data centers within the country. Uh, so we are a cloud edge and a cloud using country. What that means is we have identical exposure to every technical threat that any country in the world experiences. We have a very interesting situation though we struggle for skills, we mm -hmm. have a split demographic, we have top end first world environment in our cities, and we have African rondavals 50 kilometers away in shanty towns. Everybody who lives in these environments works across the environments. Um, we're coming out of this uh, COVID induced digitalization, I call it, where we have had to work from home. Yeah. We have staff in probably some of the best equipped companies in the world. Um, it's not shabby on, on, a, on a par with Nigeria. And, and I think it's competitive in some cases we think we're better, but we reserve the point. It's healthy mm. competition to be at the front of the race. And we find that our staff who are as skilled anywhere in the world, we have to pay first world rates to keep them employed because they're mobile. When they work from home, they have no mobile network. Their data yeah. coverage is basic GSM, yet they work in an environment where they're used to gigabit per second connectivity to the desk. Working from home becomes a technical infrastructure issue. The digital divide has been rammed down our throats. It's not being addressed. So as we come out of COVID, we're getting a wake up call. If we wish to remain competitive, we have an education gap, we have an infrastructure gap, and business is not playing its part yet. Wow, so that tells me we're gonna to have to have more of these conversations. So I have the unenviable role of having to cut this short because we have another conversation right behind us and we wanna make sure we start this promptly. I wanna leave a few minutes for each of you to say a couple of parting words. I'm definitely gonna to have to have you come back. This is just the beginning, as I mentioned many times throughout the last four days is that this is the beginning of a number of conversations that I wanna have, so please, understand that these are things that we're going to continue to revisit and explore. There's so much information, so much knowledge and information that we have not covered today. So with that, I want to leave a few words for each of our guests to say to the world. Start with, how about Dorian? Yeah, right, it's, so been, it's been oh, sorry. very interesting. Um, we are a bit behind Nigeria, of course. We've <laughs> only passed our cybersecurity bill in parliament this year. And let me just say a, a quick thing, like for me, one of the issues, as Steve pointed out, is the skills gap. I mean, 
uh, my my friends in Nigeria know about the WASC, the West African Secondary School Certification Examination. I don't know if it's just our type of WASC, but we don't even have computing or information, you know, info, uh, like a computer science module in that, like there is in uh, GCSE. So from that point, we've already failed a lot of young guys who are biting at the teeth to get into cybersecurity because these things should have been started from the primary school level to the secondary school level to get their appetite wet. But I hope that I get a chance to say more about this in the future. So <laughs> yeah, it's been great. <laughs> I've learned a lot. Oh, thank you, Dorian. Confidence. Okay, uh, thank you. Speak again and just give my closing remarks. Um, uh, I don't look really um, the Nigerian threat landscape and what regulators, for example, in some of the sectors are doing. Um, but I really want to. Um, I'm really, I'm really generally advocating. Like I did, uh, I was invited for um, the when they were having um, um, the the committee. So what they call the bankers committee retreat, and I was invited to speak um, in cyber security there. But basically, um, advocate for. Um, consumer cyber security awareness education and that key thing I think is missing um, mm. a key thing that must be done not by one stakeholder but generally uh, holding hands together while while, while uh, um, these enterprises are protected when the users of technologies when the users of those services um, begin to face issues maybe around social engineering for example I've like seen to be the number one cyber threat in Nigeria and they're not getting enough education to put them um I, I, uh, mm -hmm. we are doing our self service because then we will not be driving up the financial inclusion because the people who are included are seeing the risk for that risk um so i think very strongly cyber security awareness for the consumer targeted towards person be global i i agree steve <laughs> uh. I think I'm, I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants here to carry on. I, I can, I'm enjoying the, co the conversations I'm sitting in on. I'm enjoying the conversations I'm taking part in. Uh, yeah. We need to share. What I have heard is solutions to almost all of the problems we are engaging with individually, but they're coming in a piecemeal basis. Mm -hmm. I think collectively we could be unstoppable. So I think the, these conversations should continue. Uh, I would certainly love to take part in future. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Uh, I always like to think I am making a difference. Uh, until someone tells me otherwise, I'm not going to stop. You're welcome. So, so it's great thank having you. For you. Letting me join in. And at Adoy, I'll, I'll leave a few last words to you. Thank you, Jonathan. I was quite interested in, in Steve's um, conversation about what's happening in South Africa, which seems quite similar to Nigeria. And it'll be great to learn a little bit more about that. And I think to his point, it, it just shows that um, we need to share a lot more information or we need to collaborate a lot more. I agree with the emphasis on people and awareness, and I think it's an important part of the puzzle. But I think another very important part of the puzzle that we often overlook is processes because the the nature of african economies institutions nations is that continuity is very much lacking skills are very mobile and except you have processes that help you to at least have a basis for how we do things around here then we keep going back to zero when those skills move and so we must build strong processes and we must also use technology effectively. We need all pieces of the puzzle, you know, but clearly people are typically the weakest link, but you need something for the people to work on. And that's where the processes come to play. I think the other challenge that we have experienced, certainly in Nigeria recently, is just the mobility of skills. So we have a small crop of very highly skilled people, and those people are in very high demand by more advanced economies who have taken out a lot of them. And so we're going to have, we're having to start grooming the next level again. So I think that cybersecurity, we must look at it from a very holistic point of view. There are many people, stakeholders that have a role to play, from the regulators to the organizations to the, to the man on the street. And we must look at it holistically and not make sure that we are taking cognizance of both the, the people, the processes and the technology mm -hmm. and keep the conversation going, keep the collaboration going so that we can all move forward faster mm -hmm. and learn more, more from one another.
Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, we come to an end. So like as she just mentioned, we want to keep the conversation going. We will keep the conversation going immediately after this. We have another panel right behind us, which is about COVID-19 and balancing privacy and technology and looking at the challenges between the two. But as our panel made very clear, we want to keep this conversation. So I extend the offer to all of you out there, become a Taya ambassador. We want to make sure that we can keep this conversation moving because there's so much knowledge and information to be shared. So with that, thank you very much, everybody, for joining me. We'll see you again later. Bye-bye.